Hi there. My name is Ken Mayer. I'm going to be your instructor on this course. Now, I've been involved with something that uh, has initials like information systems, information technology, since the very early 80s. So if you did the math, uh, let me just tell you, I started when I was fifth grade. I'm not as old as you think. So over that time, obviously, there was a point where there was no wireless. Uh, and so I worked with networks, network infrastructure, routers and switches with operating systems, uh, you know, all kind of stuck in that wired type of medium. Uh, I mean, I was, uh, well, unfortunately, a young adult when I saw my first cell phone. But uh, anyway, eventually we moved into wireless. And I've worked a lot with uh, wireless uh, types of deployments, obviously with training as well. Uh, primarily, my focus has been with uh, Cisco's wireless solutions, uh, with some firewalls wireless solutions like the old net screen that became part of Juniper. I uh, worked with uh, some training and deployments of Aruba networks as well. So I think that I have a, at least a pretty good idea about how to actually configure these devices. But what's important here is that I'm going to convey to you uh, what we know about the different standards and how you can figure out how to uh, actually do the configuration of uh, the actual specific product, but I want you to be able to know uh, the different standards, the different goals, and I've done a lot of work in the world of security, ethical hacking, uh, you know, for wired or for wireless or for operating systems, and so I'm hoping that I'm going to take the uh, knowledge that I have and to be able to apply it to this uh, specifically in the wireless arena to be able to help you get better with wireless security. Now, in this module, we're going to start off with what we call the Wireless LAN Security Overview. And just remember, it is designed to be an overview. My goal here is to uh, introduce some topics that we're going to see as we go through our course and to uh, kind of give us, uh, you know, just that little bit of a carrot to make sure that you want to uh, keep going through. Some of the nicest things that we see about uh, this particular course is that we are dealing with wireless, which is very popular, and security. So, I mean, how do we go wrong? We're doing both. So what we're going to do in this module is talk a bit about the history. Where did we come from when it came to uh, the security of wireless networks? We'll talk about the different standards organizations, such as the ISO uh, or the, uh, engineer, uh, the uh, Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF. We'll also take a look at a review of the OSI model, very important for networking, even though we're going to be focusing at layers one and two, but we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll take a look at the uh, ISOC hi hierarchy. Uh, that hierarchy will kind of give you an idea again about how these different uh, uh, organizations work together, uh, including things like the Wi-Fi Alliance standards. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the basics, hopefully a review for all of you that are here in the security part of this for 802.11. We'll look at different types of connections, uh, some of the 802.11 security basics, data privacy. We'll talk about the AAA, the authentication, authorization, and accounting, segmentation, monitoring, policies, uh, and then, of course, we'll move into the security standards that we first started seeing uh, introduced with the 802.11i, and uh, that includes, of course, the uh, wired protective uh, access, the WPA. We'll also talk about uh, robust secure networks, or RSN, and talk a bit about the future of 802.11 security. So let's talk a little bit about where we came from. So back uh, in 2007, the IEEE with the 802.11-2007 defined what a wireless local area network is, or what we call the WLAN. And, you know, if you think about it, we've always been working with security on our wired networks. And when I say we've always looked at that, because, you know, it was pretty easy, right? We contained the signal within a copper or fiber cable, and, uh, you know, we always have to worry about uh, still encrypting traffic because people could sniff those particular signals as they were uh, being sent uh, from one device to the other or do other types of malicious things like man in the middles to be able to, uh, to grab that information. So we got into things like encryption and certificates and all of those sort of things. Uh, but it was bounded by that medium. And um, when we think about wireless, now of course here we're emitting radio frequency. So anybody with a radio was able to pick up on those transmissions. And when we first started looking at wireless, we really didn't have a security mechanism in there. Uh, other than distance, right? Uh, I mean, if you were, you know, a mile or two miles away from my access point, I wasn't worried about you eavesdropping in my traffic. If you're sitting out in my parking lot, then I was a little bit more worried. And of course, Wi-Fi standards have changed now where we are covering great distances with wireless, but we'll get into some of that a little bit later, at least on the security aspects. So originally, uh, there was, everybody had kind of a bad taste 
uh, for um, you know the feeling of how secure a wireless local area network was. I mean, they are easy to implement because we ha didn't have to worry about cables. We just had to worry about placement of an access point and uh, making sure that it was connected to the wired network. But now what we're going to see as we go throughout this course is how much more secure wireless can be for us. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of the security mechanisms that we're going to talk about. And I'll try to give you a good 30,000 foot view, maybe even a 10,000 foot view, uh, at least during this particular uh, module uh, with things like uh, encryption and authentication, what authorization means, and the use of segmentation through uh, what we call the virtual local area networks uh, or the VLANs. And most of what we're going to do is, like I said, we're going to focus at layer two, uh, a bit about layer one, but, uh, you know, the, uh, at this point we're assuming that you're pretty comfortable with the 802.11 A's, B's, G's, N's, AC's, and those types of things. Now we are going to uh, mention a lot of the different standards, and of course there's different organizations that present those standards to us. So as we're moving throughout this course, you'll see a lot of these uh, being listed and how they helped uh, build the foundation for security as well as for the different types of wireless access that we have. One of the first ones that you'll see is the ISO, the International Standards Organization. They're the ones that created what we call the uh, Open System Interconnect Model or the OSI model. The IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, they create a lot of the standards for compatibility and coexistence between network equipment, not just wired but also wireless. And if you think about it, that's very important because how difficult would it be if uh, all of the vendors that were involved in wireless were using their own standards, then we were kind of stuck with one company or another company and wouldn't have that uh, compatibility or interoperability. Probably be even more difficult for our clients trying to install the right software for a uh, proprietary solution on all of the uh, different laptops or uh, mobile devices that we use. The IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, also creates internet standards as they integrate into the wireless and wired networks. And the Wi-Fi Alliance is uh, designed to help uh, perform certification testing. So, uh, you know, that's a little tag that you see if you're buying any type of wireless device and you see the Wi-Fi Alliance and you know that it's been tested and it should work with uh, any multi-vendor solution that you have. All right, so I do want to talk a little bit about the OSI model, the Open System Interconnect. And uh, when we look at this, we generally draw a line and we talk about having these upper layers and these lower layers. And I don't think there's anything wrong with us uh, going through this. If you've never seen it before, then uh, this can be important just to get an idea of what's happening uh, all throughout our network or when it comes to uh, uh, both the wired and the wireless. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the upper layers. Uh, that's a little bit uh, outside of the scope of what we want to look at. But I will start at least uh, at layer 7, the application layer. And that's basically uh, anytime we uh, interact with the operating system. Now, I know you might hear different uh, definitions like um, applications like uh, web browsing, HTTP, or FTP for file transfers, or, you know, different things. But that is what we're doing is we're, we, the, you know, as people are interacting with the operating system. They have a presentation layer. Uh, I like to call that the format. And uh, the biggest thing here I can just say is, you know, sometimes uh, I used to say it's how things are stored. But that didn't make sense because everything is stored in binary as ones and zeros, whether it's a solid state drive or a hard drive. But the format made sense because if we were to look at like graphic files, uh, the way in which we encode a JPEG uh, would be different than, um, you know, the old bitmaps or any of these other things. Or if we went into uh, audio files, we used to have a lot of WAV files before MP3 uh, got popular. And that's all it is. It's, it's a way in which we encode or format uh, information. And that's information that's going to be read, obviously, by the application at some point. And then the session information, uh, we generally look at it uh, as kind of an interaction of, uh, you know, a client. I'll draw my laptop, let's say, to a server. And let's say you're ordering something online, and uh, you're not the only one probably ordering from this uh, particular web server. And you would like to make sure that uh, customer A's orders doesn't get mixed up with customer B's. So we create sessions, ways of uh, being able to separate the uh, different traffic streams so that uh, we can make sense out of them. And that's about all I want to say there. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, move down to layer one. But before I do, uh, again, that IEEE standard and everything that follows under 802.11-2007, uh, 
is going to define what happens for us at layers one and two. And so I'm going to talk both about wired and wireless uh, a bit, just so we have a good idea of what we mean uh, at these different layers. So as an example, uh, the physical is really what we decide to call media, or, or the medium that uh, you send information. And we refer to them as bits, because whether it's wired or wireless, we are still sending a bunch of ones and zeros. And uh, that information has to uh, be able to be transmitted. Now, obviously, uh, in the wired network, we often have things like copper. Some people might call it Cat5, Cat7, Cat5e. Uh, some people just call it an Ethernet or twisted pair, or whatever that copper wire is. It's just a way of transmitting ones and zeros. Uh, obviously, we also had uh, fiber, or uh, what some people would call optical, uh, which does the same thing. It's transmitting ones and zeros, but doing so by uh, you know the way in which it uh, sends uh, the, the photons, light beams, down the... Uh, the actual cables. We are going to be, of course, focusing on radio frequency. That's what we want it to uh, be able to uh, distinguish and talk about ways of securing those transmissions. And so RF is a part of what we look at at layer one. And, uh, and there are, of course, uh, as um, uh, in some of the uh, more basic courses, we talk about the different methods in which we can uh, transmit uh, this information. Um, you know, whether it's uh, uh, frequency hopping or any of the other types of uh, options that are out there. But uh, our goal is not to worry about how we're transmitting uh, in this course. It's about how to secure what's being transmitted. All right, so uh, then comes the data link layer. Now, the data link layer is a little trickier. It actually has two sub-layers, uh, one that uh, interacts, uh, we'll call it the MAC layer, with layer one, and then the other, the uh, link layer, that uh, sublayer, I should say, that uh, makes its attachment or helps communicate with the uh, networking addresses. And, uh, and so we're, again, we're going to focus on this part of it. But really, what we're talking about here at layer two is a way of uh, forwarding traffic. And by forwarding traffic, we're going to do so generally by hardware addresses. In our case, uh, the uh, MAC address that we call the media access control. A and so um, traditionally, in a wired network, what we would have seen is uh, an object that we often called a switch. And on a switch, you would have a number of uh, end stations connected to it, maybe another switch connected to it. And as traffic would come in, the switch would look at its MAC address. Inside that switch would be a MAC address table that would uh, associate with uh, specific ports. And so the switch would look at that MAC address and say, oh, okay, I know where to send that traffic. I'm going to send it out to uh, whichever port uh, is out there. So we didn't have any broadcast. Unlike, well, if I went back to layer one and talked about a wired network, and we could uh, almost uh, make this analogy with radio frequency too. When we had a hub, the problem with the hub was when the traffic would come in, it would automatically go out every single port. So anybody who's connected to it would be able to hear that traffic. So it wasn't inherently very secure. Can't we say that about radio frequency, uh, right? Because uh, from an access point, uh, let's see how well I can draw my little robot uh, access point, right? As we're sending out radio frequency, anybody with a radio can hear that traffic. So in a way, it kind of uh, sounds like that wired hub, uh, at least in the way I'm trying to describe it. And so when we went into the data link layer, we were able to make more intelligent forwarding decisions. And, uh, and for us, it's kind of important to understand what's happening, because if you think about it, in our uh, setup, we're going to have uh, an access port that is hardwired into a switch. And so while we're doing radio frequency uh, to connect to uh, you know, whatever portable device is out here, um, that information is going to be translated into an electrical signal from the access point, and it's going to eventually go into the switch where, again, it will be forwarded based on its MAC address. And, of course, there could be multiple access points out here, and uh, we know that we also look at the MAC address of the access point, so we know which one we're associated with. And, uh, and so that's, um, again, things that we're going to look at at the data link layer. But we are going to want to talk about ways to encrypt our traffic and uh, what that process is going to be like so that the uh, communications between these wireless devices and the access point or the two stations, whatever word you want to use, uh, we'll uh, be able to uh, secure that traffic. And, and we want to talk about, and we'll talk about, security when we get into the wired network through things like segmentation and um, you know, being able to say, well, you're a guest, so I only want you to be able to get to the internet from my network. And if you're an employee, I want you to be able to get to the local area network. 
and to the internet or whatever else uh, we want to secure. So it's more than just encrypting the radio, the signal that we're transmitting through radio frequency. It's also going to be on the wired side that we want to talk about security options. All right, so now to get beyond layer two, um, and the problem with layer two, I don't know if I have enough room to uh, keep drawing this in here, uh, is that we had what we called a broadcast domain. And what that just simply meant is that if I had a bunch of switches connected to each other, and uh, your uh, host sent a broadcast in here, it would go throughout the entire network. And the more hosts that I would add, the more broadcast traffic, and it would start to eat up your bandwidth. And so we wanted to find a way to break up those broadcast domains. And one of the ways to do that was to uh, create a logical address for each broadcast domain. And we did that primarily by introducing what we call IP addresses, Internet Protocol. Uh, we're not going to get into the differences between uh, IP4 and IP6 throughout this course, but it's, I think, important just to understand what's happening. And so the idea was is that if I wanted to stop the broadcast, I could put in a Layer 3 device that we normally called a router, and that router would look at the IP address and figure out the best way to send that traffic without uh, 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 allowing broadcast traffic to go through. And so that's what we see uh, when we get into the IP address, is that each of these um, broadcast domains would have their own network addresses, and the router, like I said, wouldn't allow the broadcast through, and so we would have just unicast traffic. At the transport layer, we're talking about a communications uh, uh, protocol. How do the machines talk to each other? Why can uh, Macs talk to uh, uh, PCs, talk to Linux, and the rest of them? It's because we're speaking the same language. And uh, without getting too far into those languages, we used uh, two, primarily two different protocols. One is the Transmission Control Protocol, TCP, which is meant for unicast, meaning one-to-one -one traffic, and UDP, which uh, is uh, designed to work as a multicast or as a broadcast type of uh, transmission, meaning from uh, point to multipoint or broadcast to everyone. Uh, and that's the user datagram protocol. So hopefully that's built kind of a good foundation, and I hope that I've uh, kind of cleared up where we're going to look. We obviously are going to really focus on layer one and layer two. And this little thing I talked about uh, over here with the segmentation, that's where we're going to get into the VLANs and have a good understanding of how we use VLANs to separate our traffic. And, uh, and that's also something that happens at layer two. So that's, um, hopefully, like I said, giving you the introduction of all of these things that we want to talk about and, of course, where our focus is going to be. So we're going to at least kind of uh, take a look again at the uh, different uh, groups that we work with under what we call the Internet Society or the ISOC. And um, here's where you're going to kind of get an idea of uh, some of the breakdowns. So uh, we have the, uh, uh, at least if we take this little trail off here to our left, we have the uh, Internet Architecture Board. I won't talk too much about what they do for us, but uh, they are a group that is um, going to be working with things like the uh, Internet Engineering Steering Group, and they're uh, kind of the ones that come up with bright ideas that we see the uh, Internet uh, Engineering Task Force work with. And, you know, the IETF does uh, quite a bit for us. I mean, they certainly talk about ideas for uh, Internet. I mean, they're the ones that developed uh, many of the routing protocols, maybe uh, deal with uh, real-time applications or applications, uh, ideas for security. They're the ones that are going to basically, you know, whether it's just a general category, operations and management, routing, transport layer, most all communications, right, based on the Internet, um, are going to be dealt with by the IETF. And they are constantly coming up with better uh, methods of doing these communications or new methods of these communications. And they often publish them as RFCs or what we call request for comments. Now, going over to the next side, the ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, they're the ones that are going to deal with uh, things like IP addresses or whether or not you can have a uh, .org or .com or, you know, a lot of these different uh, names and numbers, autonomous systems for routing protocols. Uh, you know, so we're going to work with those um, as well. Well, at some level, somebody will. We're not going to uh, get uh, too far into that uh, at this point. We're going to really kind of focus on what uh, we see the IETF doing for us. And uh, the Internet Architecture Board, as you can see, also 
uh, is uh, going to be dealing with the Internet Research Task Force. And again, that's what I said, you know, between the two of these guys, they're going to come up with these great ideas. And then uh, through the IETF, we're going to try to come up with uh, these proposals. The nice thing about an RFC, whether it's for security or for anything else, the great thing about that is the um, fact that uh, it's a, a collaborative effort. Everybody that's a member can improve on an idea. So, you know, when we get and talk about RFCs, there might be one RFC that everybody lists for the final product. So, I mean, even if it uh, came up to uh, uh, just establishing, um, you know, things like uh, routing protocols, as I mentioned before, one of the things that are, are listed here. Um, you know, it wasn't just one brilliant paper. It was a combination of uh, everybody adding on to each RFC, and of course, as they do, um, then the RFCs get numbered higher and higher and higher. But that is why it is called a um, uh, request for comment, because that's what we're encouraging, is having the uh, Internet community comment and try to make all of our protocols even better. Now remember the Wi-Fi Alliance. It's been around since 99, had a different name before that. They changed it um, in 2002 to the Wi-Fi Alliance. So it's been around for a while. Uh, remember, they're the ones that are trying to verify that um, you meet certain standards. And uh, this is, again, just kind of designed to be a little bit of a review of, uh, of the standards that are out there. One of the first ones, of course, is the way in which we send our signals, you know, the, uh, both the frequency and uh, the different methods of encoding. So um, as just a quick review, some of the things you might see here uh, are things like um, 802.11a. Now, you know, you might think that since it uh, has the lowest letter on the alphabet, that that would have been the first, latest, and greatest. It was one that operated, as a, just a reminder, right at 5 gigahertz. Had data speeds up to 54 megabits per second. But the problem with that uh, frequency was that it wasn't the uh, what we call the junk band. Uh, the junk band uh, being what we call the uh, um, industry scientific and medical uh, which was at the uh, 2.4 gigahertz range. And that was one that was unlicensed. And so uh, even though we might see this uh, 802.11a and think, oh, that sounds great, but you know everybody used B, which was at the 2.4 and had only 11 megabits of, uh, of throughput, you might say, well, why did we want to go with a standard that was sharing a frequency with uh, your, your microwaves and your remote control cars and everything else out there? Well, the biggest reason, of course, was the cost. Uh, this was a cheap equipment to buy uh, compared to going to the 5 gigahertz range. Then we saw some improvements in the methods in which we did encoding with 802.11g, um, which uh, got us up to speeds, uh, again, up to uh, uh, 54 uh, megabits uh, per second. And, uh, and that, of course, like I said, that was G. Then we were all excited when 802.11 came out, uh, 802.11n, because uh, we could do either 2.4 or 5. Uh, and we had higher speeds, you know, some would say 100 megabits plus, depending on uh, what's out there. And the recent ones uh, that I hope that you've uh, seen or researched is AC. Uh, AC is promising gigabit per second speed for throughput. Uh, so some amazing things as we're watching the uh, technology improve. And if you think about it, gigabit uh, throughput for wireless is just an incredible idea. And um, that's going to, you know, for a lot of you, who are working at a wired end station, you might still be on a uh, 100 megabit uh, fast Ethernet and might not even have the gigabit access. But uh, we certainly are seeing that we are moving this into a good uh, enterprise production field. Uh, some of the other things that uh, they would, uh, again, try to uh, make sure that we are, uh, or at least, as this, remember, the goal is to certify you here. They didn't define these standards. They're just making sure that you're uh, there. Uh, we are going to talk a lot more about uh, uh, WPA and WPA2, the Wi-Fi uh, protected access, uh, and the differences between those, um, especially when we're uh, going to get into an enterprise solution for uh, security. So we'll uh, cover more of these in more detail. Um, again, there's a, a Wi-Fi protected setup, a Wi-Fi protected access that, uh, that they're going to uh, make sure that we're uh, set up for which, uh, again, is uh, a part of what we're going to get into uh, later on to talk about the robust secure network or robust security network. And, uh, and there are two versions of the WPA2. Uh, one, of course, is the uh, personal, which would be great for your home users, and one that is the enterprise. When Again, when we break it down, we're going to talk about how we use some uh, external authentication mechanisms uh, for WPA2. Sorry, I just kind of went off tar tar target there. Uh, but it's, it's still part of that protected access where we defined 
Uh, see, I didn't go too far off to topic. That's uh, kind of a part of uh, the WPA too. Uh, the Wi-Fi Multimedia, the WMM. Uh, so here we're going to start, well, we'll introduce it. Um, quality of service is an important aspect because there are a lot of Wi-Fi voice over IP phones or uh, streams that are more important than others. You know, if uh, I've got somebody who wants to uh, download the latest and greatest pictures from Facebook, that might interfere with traffic that's more important so we can uh, provide uh, some of those uh, accesses to that multimedia, especially because multimedia uh, has a big deal with latency. Um, I mean, if there's too much time lag between the time you say hello on the telephone and the other person uh, finally answers back, you think you're on a uh, walkie-talkie or CB uh, radio rather than on a uh, quality voice circuit. Um, the uh, WMM Power Save, the PS, is great for uh, all those things I call the BYOD, the bring your own device, laptop or tablet or uh, smartphone or whatever we have today. But who knows, maybe uh, in another couple of years we'll be talking about your your wristwatch or something else. Uh, but it's uh, designed to help conserve uh, battery. And, uh, and that's an important issue, basically being able to send a wake-up call uh, when uh, traffic is, uh, is coming in there. Uh, the CWGRF, the Converged Wireless Group RF Profile, uh, Radio Frequency uh, Profile. Converged means that we are mixing different types of traffic. And uh, this is where, so, you know, we are going to focus, obviously, up here on this 80211. But uh, there are other types of traffic that, are, uh, that we might deal with, uh, which is a little bit out, like I said, of our uh, uh, purview of this course. So that's my cell phone, by the way, for those of you who don't remember the old flip phones where you pulled out the antenna. Maybe it's just me because I'm so old or been around here for a while. But uh, they do radio frequency as well, only they're connecting to uh, a cell tower. And so we're seeing layer one up to this point, and from the cell tower, converting it into layer two, uh, as it gets into uh, their actual network, what we call the uh, home agent uh, of where they connect. And, uh, and if you think about it, they're converging uh, today when we start talking about things like uh, uh, 4G networks. And one of the uh, new buzzwords is like voice over LTE that they call Volte. And so we are converging, uh, actually packetizing the voice and uh, the uh, data on the uh, same signal. So that's an example of a converged uh, one of those uh, types of networks. And uh, the last one here, uh, the voice personal application, uh, again, is um, for residential or small business Wi-Fi networks where you might, again, be mixing voice and data traffic, um, maybe even traffic for printers. Uh, so you could almost uh, call this kind of a converged idea as well, but more or less converged for uh, the smaller, uh, what we call the uh, remote office, branch office, the robos, or some people call them SOHOs, the small office, home office. Now we're going to assume that you already have the networking basics down for 802.11. Remember that the 802.11 standards are based on the OSI layers 1 and 2. One of the things I mentioned about uh, layer 1, of course, was the medium, but uh, layer 2 was uh, things like switches, or in this case, access points. And, uh, and that's going to be important when we talk about the different layers. So at the moment, uh, the assumption is that you know what the basics are, and, uh, and that you know how wireless is working at both layers. Remember, our goal is to talk about securing that traffic. But we also want to make sure we have a good idea of the overall picture of the network and how the two, wireless and wired, work together in a standard type or best practice type of uh, distribution or uh, layers. And we call the layers core, distribution, and access. The access layer is basically where everybody connects. When I say everybody, whether you're off of a wireless access point, whether you're off, connected on a wired uh, uh, switch, that's the access layer. It's how you get in. To get from where you are to some other users or some other server or resource, you're going to go through a distribution layer. And depending, again, on the size of that corporation, you may even have to go into the core infrastructure to be able to get to other distribution areas, to get to other access layers. And I'll draw that out for you here in just a second. But uh, to make sure that, you, like I said, you're just getting the big picture of uh, what's actually happening and where we're going to be living as far as our security concerns. So when we take a look at the access layer, as I said, uh, you know, I'll put in the PCs, whether they're wireless or not. That's where they're connecting in to uh, things like the switches. So the squares are switches. And, uh, and of course, for us, we might have our discussion about you know, having the wireless access point. 
Uh, maybe, you know, we're, we're doing an extended service set. We'll, uh, you know, maybe roaming, whatever the case may be. And, uh, but either way, we're at the access layer, and that's where everything is at. And, and let's say somewhere else in our network we have a server farm that we want to be able to access, or maybe we have, uh, as I said, a, uh, uh, you know, access to the Internet or whatever the case may be. But that's where we're going to get into the distribution layer. The distribution layer that I'll just abbreviate here is a lot of where we see routing going on. That's going into the IP address uh, idea. So, you know, if you imagine if you were that, um, that you were connecting wirelessly here uh, at one point of the network, maybe even in a, in a different part of the building, uh, you're going to have to uh, be able to get out of the access layer to the distribution layer. And the distribution layer could just easily enough take you through routing to uh, some other location. Now, we also talk about the core. The core is where we do all of the high speed. By the way, when we are talking about security, we are going to be looking at the access layer. But just technically speaking, your wired security is going to be happening at the distribution layer. The core layer is nothing about speed, or I should say is not nothing about speed. It's all about speed. Uh, no real sense of security there. We just want uh, traffic to move as quickly as we can. And as I said, it might be that it's connecting to a server farm or some other set of resources that also require high-speed connectivity, right? Um, and again, we may have to go from the distribution layer to the core, but again, it's the distribution layer that got us there, uh, going through the core network to get to that server farm. Or as I said, it could be leaving that core, going out to uh, the cloud, where I'm going to put the uh, evil spy-looking thing. By the way, that's uh, supposed to be uh, a mustache from... Uh, if any of you ever saw Bullwinkle and remember Boris, he always had that little evil mustache. Uh, but that's my internet cloud. And again, uh, we often look at that uh, as well as uh, having the uh, high-speed connections off of the core. So that's your big picture. And as I've uh, said already once, say it again, we are going to focus on security, but we're going to be doing that here at the access layer. And then we'll let the wired security people take care of uh, the security in their own distribution layer. Now, there are different types of connections that we're going to talk about. Um, and again, remember, these are different layers. It depends on what we're looking for. But if we're talking about wireless connectivity, one type of connection is a point-to-point. -point. It might be often what we call a wireless bridge, where you may be doing uh, wireless from one building to another uh, building to bridge them together rather than running cables in between. I've seen that happen a few times because of poor, uh, poor planning when it came to moving a building. As an example, I remember a university who moved their ticket office uh, from the stadium to a place across the street. In the city there, wouldn't give them the permission to uh, dig up the uh, road to be able to string cable between. They didn't want to pay to go through a service provider for what uh, amounted to a 60-foot run. So they were looking at uh, ways of doing a point-to-point -point connection. The most common Wi-Fi connection we see is point-to-multipoint. We have that single access point that is connecting to multiple uh, different uh, wireless devices. So it is a one-to-many. Uh, also in the world of security, which we will look at as far as some of uh, the other options, are things like the wireless LAN controllers. Those are things that are going to give us mobility, can help increase security, help us with segmentation. Uh, and it's uh, generally a communication from the access point to that centralized wireless LAN controller. In fact, you might have multiple wireless LAN controllers that are being uh, controlled by a single wireless LAN controller controller. Uh, as for example, Cisco calls it the WCS, the uh, wireless LAN controller's um, ability to work with multiple ones of those. Uh, we are going to get into uh, some of the security options, especially the WPA2 uh, enterprise, where we have to have authentication points. Whether it's an Active Directory server, or it's a RADIUS server, or a TACAC server, but it's a place where the access point can uh, collect your information and verify that you are the right person. And, of course, there might be those types of anonymous access that we see at your local coffee shop or uh, eatery that, uh, you know, everybody's now saying, okay, hey, come eat here, uh, come have a coffee, you can read your paper, you can surf, uh, you don't have to log in or have any accounts. So when we look at the 802.11 security basics, there are going to be five major components that we want to work with. One is the data privacy. We'll call that the encryption. The other are the AAA services. As again, that was the authentication, uh, who you are, the authorization, what you can do, and the accounting, which is keeping track of what you did. Segmentation gets us into the wired network for the most part. Um, again, uh, we'll look at that with uh, the VLANs. 
Obviously, we want to be able to monitor what's happening. Uh, we can do that uh, either by just looking at logs on the access point, or if we're using a centralized uh, wireless LAN controller, uh, that often is going to be able to not only monitor, but be able to tell you about uh, you know, where somebody's moving, how they're roaming, any uh, unexpected devices, or even any unexpected types of uh, access points that we call rogue types of uh, options or um, rogue access points. And then, of course, policy. Policy could be corporate policy, corporate security policy, could be laws and regulations in the jurisdiction in which you're operating that you have to follow. Now, there are some other types of security devices. I mentioned how the wireless LAN controller can help you with monitoring or even send off alerts if it uh, does something like rogue detection. And again, rogue detection is finding that wireless access point that doesn't belong. Maybe somebody brought one into the office because they uh, wanted to be able to pick up their laptop and move around and, uh, and you won't give them an access point. So, so it's not uncommon. People will bring their own type of access and that's always a bad thing because then they're uh, creating a new method of connecting into your network uh, without going through your security settings. There's also tools like the wireless intrusion detection systems and uh, those again can be very important for us. Intrusion detection is not just malware but again uh, might be a part of the rogue detection whether it's an access point or maybe an unexpected device connecting to our network that shouldn't be there.